Good morning. Our subject this morning is sermon number two. And the subject is the believer's inheritance. Reading from the Gospel of St. Luke, beginning with verse 10, chapter 19. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. And as they heard these things, he added and spake a parable. Because he was nigh to Jerusalem, and because they thought the kingdom of God should immediately appear. He said, therefore, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a message after him, saying, We will not have this man to reign over us. And it came to pass that as he was returned, having received the kingdom, he commanded the servants to be called unto him, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Then came the first, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained ten pounds. And he said unto him, Well, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in a very little, have thou authority over ten cities. And the second came, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained five pounds. And he said likewise to him, Be thou also over five cities. And another came, saying, Lord, behold, here is thy pound, which I have laid up in a napkin. For I fear thee, because thou art an austere man, thou takest up that thou layest up down, and reapest that thou did not sow. The Lord Jesus spoke this parable concerning his kingdom. He gave ten pounds to one man, five pounds to another man, and one pound to the third man. And he instructed them to go out and use those pounds to bring in an increase. He wanted his account to increase by their very shrewd trading. And so the first man went out and he diligently traded and came back and offered the Lord an extra 10 pounds. Then the second man did the same. With his five pounds, he multiplied it into 10 pounds. The third man came and said, you know, I, I knew you were a hard man and so I was afraid to use mine, I might lose it, so I laid it up in a napkin and here it is, and you can have it back. You'll notice this third man did nothing with the responsibility that was laid upon him. He did nothing, and he gained nothing. The Lord severely chastised him. Now this is a parable. But a parable is a story taken from ordinary life and used as an illustration of a truth. And behind every parable, there is a great truth. And he spoke this parable concerning his kingdom. And behind this parable is a great truth. And that great truth is this. When Jesus comes back, he's the nobleman. When he comes back to rule and reign over this world for a thousand years, he will call us in for an accounting. And if we were faithful, and if we multiply that pound, which is the gospel we believe, he will reward us openly. There will be a thousand year reign of Christ upon the earth. 
The English word millennium comes from two Latin words which are a thousand and annum, which is a year. The millennium or the kingdom of Christ, they're one and the same, is a time period. Several of the time periods in our language come from the Latin language. Millennium, which refers to the kingdom, is just another one of those time words. So millennium is a thousand year period. It is a time period, just as an hour is a time period. A year is a time period. A century is a time period. The millennium will begin when Satan is bound after the great battle of Armageddon and it ends a thousand years later when Satan is loosed for a little season. It is a new age. It is a new order. For 300 years, in the dark centuries of persecution by the Roman Empire, the hope of a millennial kingdom was a luminous light to comfort the souls of the Christian believers. Every one of the anti-Nicene fathers, every preacher of Christ who lived in the first 300 years after Jesus spoke of the hope of a personal reign of our Lord upon the earth. Papias, Justin Martyr, Ignatius, Irenaeus, Tertullian, all of them spoke with one accord, without exception, of the glorious hope of the millennial reign of Christ upon this earth for a total of 1,000 years, and then on into eternity after that. They delivered this message not only as a doctrine of the Scripture, but that they had received it from the Lord and from His disciples. But what said the Scriptures? We're more interested in what the Scripture says than what the early church leaders had to say. In Daniel chapter 7, Daniel wrote this. And this was many years before Jesus came to earth. He said, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like unto the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom that which will not be destroyed. Verse 13 and 14 of Daniel 7. Revelation 22, 5 assures us that we will receive a reward from the Lord. It is our inheritance. Revelation 22, 5. And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they, that's believers, shall reign forever and ever. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 12. If we suffer with Him, we shall also reign with Him. And then Revelation 20 and verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God and which had not worshipped the beast neither his image neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years then in Revelation 5.10 we have the terrain we have the place the location where this reign with Christ will take place. Revelation 5.10 And has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign upon the earth. There are some who will not inherit the kingdom, while others will. In Galatians 5.21 Envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, 
of the which I tell you before, as I have told you in times past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. That shuts them out of the kingdom that's coming upon this earth. 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. You see, the kingdom of God is an inheritance. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. Again, Matthew 13, verse 41. The Son of Man shall send forth His angels, and they shall gather out of His kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity. These are the false professors who profess faith in Christ, but they do not have real salvation. We know also from the Scriptures that we have an inheritance. It is laid up in heaven for us. I read in Acts 20 and verse 32, And now, brethren, I command you to God and the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and to give you, that's grace, an inheritance among all them that are sanctified. This is a grace gift given to you. It's laid up for you in heaven. Acts 26, 18, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. This is a conjunction. Forgiveness of sins and inheritance are joined together. If there's no forgiveness of sins, there will be no inheritance for those that sin. But to those that have forgiven themselves from the Lord, who have received forgiveness, they will receive a reward. And that reward is a grace gift. They don't earn it or work for it, but it shows that those that do serve the Lord are those that have received it. We know that we are joint heirs with the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 8, 16. The Spirit itself or Himself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with Him, that we may also be glorified together. So we know that we have an inheritance. We know that we are joint heirs with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now there is mentioned in the Scriptures, Abraham. Abraham had two kinds of seed. One was a physical seed, referring to the nation of Israel, the Jewish people. The other is a spiritual seed, referring to those of our day who have put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So there are two seeds from Abraham, one physical and one spiritual. Now the physical seed, as I said, is Abraham's seed. And the present day believers are mostly the Gentiles. So we have a physical seed and a spiritual seed. Now those of us that are saved in this day and time are of the spiritual seed of Abraham. Galatians 3.29 assures us of that fact. There is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. A Jew will still be a Jew. Israel will still be Israel. A Gentile will still be a Gentile. But those in this age and in our time who have trusted in Christ, we are in His kingdom. The Bible tells us that clearly. We reign over the fact of sin in our lives. There's a twofold reign. One of the believer, which is sanctification, 
and one which is future, which is eschatological. That is referring to the nation of Israel. So there's a present reign and a spiritual reign. The physical reign in David's day was on earth. But in Jesus' day and in our day, we are under a spiritual reign. Romans chapter 6 and verse 12 tells us that we do reign over sin. Let not sin, therefore, reign, that is, as a king, over you in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lusts of the flesh. For sin shall not have dominion, that's like a king, over you. For ye are not under the law, but under grace. All believers are translated into the spiritual reign of Christ when they are converted. Colossians 1.13 declares that in no uncertain terms. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. We are in the world, but we are not of the world. And the Bible tells us in Philippians 3.20 that our citizenship is in heaven. Now the tense of the verb points to the time of our conversion. It was for the Colossians a present reality. They knew those who lived in Jesus' time that they had eternal life. They knew that they were in His kingdom. Jesus spoke of His kingdom as present active in His person while on earth. Matthew 12, 28. But if I cast out devils or demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. Now we know from the Scriptures that Jesus did cast out demons. So according to His own statement, He told them the kingdom had come unto them. That is, in His kingdom, He rules over us. And we subject ourselves willingly and gladly to Him as our King. That is the kingdom that we're in at the present time. Now the future reign is the millennium. The literal reign of Christ upon the earth for a thousand years. We read it in Revelation 5 and verse 10. And has made us unto our God kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth. So it's very clear from the scriptures that we will reign on the earth in the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is in the indicative mood, which means it is actual and real, not something possible or intended. <clears throat> it's in the future tense, which does away with preterism, and it's in the active voice, which means the subject is performing the verbal action. So here we have an absolute authority from the scripture that we shall reign with him on the earth. At the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And just as David divided the spoils of battle with his men, so Jesus, having made us joint heirs with himself, will give us a great inheritance which was from the battle of Armageddon and his reign over the earth. Now is there any scripture that equates the kingdom and the inheritance together? My point is that we have a kingdom promised to us. And there are at least two scriptures that affirm that. James chapter 2 and verse 5. Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom, which he hath promised to them that love him? Then again, there's the promise of the kingdom. 
Matthew 25, 34. And who is that kingdom for? Them that love him. Matthew 25, he shall set the sheep on his right hand and the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. So the inheritance and the kingdom are one and the same. We're going to inherit the kingdom, the kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to rule and reign with Him for a thousand years. I share with you a true story. In the last war, when the Japanese military took over Korea from the civil administration of Japan, we had in that country of Korea 40 churches, 40 little Baptist churches with 5,000 members. Because they were so faithful in meeting together, the Japanese military called the president of the convention and with endless questions, hour after hour, demanded to know what these Korean Baptists believed. After hours of exhausting interrogation, they finally got down to the second coming of Christ. And the interrogators of the Japanese military authority said to the Korean president, what do you believe about the second coming of the Lord? The pastor, and the president of the convention said, we believe that this same Jesus shall so return as he went away. The Japanese military said, And then what? The pastor answered, And then shall every knee bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The Japanese military said, Does that include our great divine emperor? The pastor answered, Sir, it includes your emperor, for our Savior is the King of kings and Lord of lords. The Japanese military then said, Do you believe this for yourself alone, or do all of you believe it? And the pastor replied, Sir, we all believe it. That's the fabric and the stature of God's believing people. We all believe it. King Frederick had won a great battle and he wanted to celebrate and he called all of his soldiers and troops to come around the throne and he wanted to commend them for their bravery in battle. And as they stepped forward, some with bandages on their heads, some with arms that had been amputated, wounded soldiers. One soldier stepped forward and accidentally stumbled and fell. And as he fell, his hand touched the golden throne. Instantly a soldier, a guard, sprang forward to dissipate that man and to take his life. And King Frederick stood to his feet and said, Hold! And he took that wounded soldier ever so tenderly and took him up to his chair, his throne, and stepped back and saluted the soldier and said to him, We have fought together and we shall reign together. And that's what Jesus is going to do for us. We're going to reign together with Him as we've served together down here. Let us pray.